I want to teach you from, if you let me, from the book of John. John was an interesting disciple. He was the only one that didn't get martyred or killed. He lived to the, into his 90s. And he, he died on an island called Patmos. He was a prisoner there. And uh, he was a young boy when he met Jesus. 18 years old when he met the Lord. He was one of the two brothers that were called the Sons of Thunder. They were very dramatic. John's the only one who believes that uh, he was so loved that he wrote in his book five times about himself and John, the one whom Jesus loved. He was the only one that thought that. No one else seemed to celebrate it, but he did. He was happy. But in his writings, what's so, uh, for you that are students, what makes the book of John so intriguing is the original script that we have. We only have four Gospels. There were many more written, believe me. There were many much more writings that just got lost over the years. Some books that didn't even make it into our Bible that the Catholic Bible has, like the Maccabees and such like. But just it's in the book of a book. It's called Apocrypha. But either way, <clears throat> the early writings were used mostly the book of Mark. That was the original scripts that were used straight into Greek. Uh, Mark was a highly uh, educated. It was a very wonderful family that Mark was part of. His uncle was, was Barnabas and his mother was, had the house in, in Jerusalem when Peter was released from prison. He went to that house where they were praying. That was his mother's house. So it was very common. A family were very powerful, strong. He gave, Barnabas gave all he had to the church. He sold all his fields and he was very committed to strong teacher of the word. And uh, he's reputed as to have been the writer actually of the book of uh, um, of Hebrews that he, they say that he wrote that but uh, some theologians think that but either way uh, this the book of Mark was used as a reference point Matthew has 224 verses exactly from the book of Mark in Matthew and Luke has 180 odd verses exactly from the book of Mark into they used as a reference point but John had no reference point he remembered from his from way back when and he wrote within the beginning he didn't try to get on the virgin birth or, or on John the Baptist he got straight down into the in the beginning was the word the revelation the, the meaning he understood about the kingdom of God. He added things in that others didn't have. He even had teachings like the vine and the branches in John 15, or he, or he had about the, in, in, uh, the woman that was caught in adultery in John 8. He had different, different things that other people didn't have either too. But for example, the two miracles that were noted in Jerusalem, he's the only one that talks about the miracles in Jerusalem. All the other miracles that were named were all other places. But John in chapter 4 writes about firsthand being close to Jesus. Jesus writes about this, and I'm going to give you a quick background so you understand. What happened was they were in Jerusalem area ministering, and they come to Jesus and say, they tell us we are baptizing more than John the Baptist. The scripture says when Jesus hears this, he says, let us leave here. He didn't want to promote a ministry. He was looking to stay on target with what he was given to do by the Father to establish a kingdom. And so they leave, and on the way back to the Galilee area, they go through the, the mountains, which is Samaria, and they stop in a town called Sikar, which is where Jacob had sunk a well. And it's midday, it's the middle of the day, it's hot. So Jesus sits at the well under the trees, and he's waiting for his disciples to get food. And a woman comes out there at midday to get water, most uncommon, because they come early morning or late evening when it's cooler. They come, and it's almost social event sometimes to get water. They interact, and she's apt, actually avoiding people. Anyway, she arrives there, and, and her life begins to unfold. She's kind of messed up. She's uh, going through so many difficult things. She's a total stranger, and typical. She pours out all that's inside of her negative because she's hurt. She's had five husbands and living with a man. And she's a, definitely a spiritual woman. She understood who the Messiah was, place of worship. She was very informed, understanding so many things, but she was tired of disappointment in marriage so she just decided she's going to live with a fellow. And so she's meeting this man, total stranger, who asked for a drink of water and she pours out all her bitterness and anger on him. And instead of revealing what he knows about her, he starts gently guiding her and he starts, you know, says to her, uh, if you knew the gift of God and who that's speaking to you, who it is that speaks to you, you would have asked of him and you would have given you living water. And he's gentle and kind and he nudges her all down the right direction into salvation. Even though he knew and had revelation about her life, he didn't jump in and tell her, girl, you are one messed up chick. Let me fix your life. Five husbands, huh? I guess you can quit blaming those men now. After five of them, there's got to be something wrong with y'all. <laughs> 
That's not what Jesus did. He was very gentle until she asked for help. And then he poured in his life to her. And he said to her, you speak the truth when you say you've had five husbands. You you have no husband because the man you're living with is not your husband. And she's so shocked at his revelatory power that she says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. And the new conversation starts and she says, you Jews say we ought to worship God in Judea or Jerusalem when we were taught to worship God here. And Jesus answered, woman, a time is coming. You'll neither worship God here or or there in Jerusalem, but rather that worship me or worship him or worship him in spirit and truth. Then he said a verse that I want to speak to you about today and teach you on, which is in John. If you want to read it with me in John chapter 4, verse 22. And he said these words, you Samaritans, worship what you do not know. How can you worship what you don't know? I don't understand why you even say that, Jesus. They were handed down the, the same Tanakh, the same Bible, the same Torah, handed down the same scriptures by Jacob, and they were taught the ways of God. How can they worship what they don't know? But we Jews worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Now, for years, I dismissed that scripture as him referring to himself as the Savior, and that he would be the Savior from the Jews. That's why they worship. But that's not at all. I began to get understanding from the Lord. He was talking to the Jewish people. They worship what they know. They know God more than the Samaritans because salvation comes from them. Salvation, all their songs and all the Psalms, all the things that they would celebrate would always rejoice at the salvation. When they have Passover, it's celebrating every time. Even in, and at Shabbat, we do the same thing. It's always remembering what God has done for us. It's always a constant reminder that we have been delivered and saved. And I began to ponder all this. Well, the Samaritans never had that experience. And the more I began to dwell on that, I began to think of how much hardship they went through. Now, for those who were not here in the first service, I want to reiterate that every one of you that are born again, you are counted as God as a Jew. The word Jew means chosen. I know that God is not into the genetics as he is into the actual relationship. It was so with Nehemiah, who wanted to exclude the compromised Jews that were there because they'd intermarried with the Syrians, and he said, they can't be part of us. And God said, actually, no, they need to be. Don't go by what you see on the outside. Don't do that. And, and those people, if they integrate and can follow me, they can all come back. So God's into relationship more than he is into your genetics. Do you understand? What qualifies you is your relationship with God. That's what qualifies you being a Jew or a child of God. So we are joint heirs with Israel. Now in Matthew 24, Jesus prophesies and he says, a more terrible time is coming that has never been or will be again. A lot of Christians try to apply these things to the the church and the end times, but it's my understanding Jesus said, I've come to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. I was sent to them. All his focus, all his prophesying, all his teaching was for the Jews and the new Jewish church that would come from this. That Then that they would go to all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part. They would take it up. But it was first to them. That's what he said. He spoke that. So when he said a more terrible time is coming that has never been, or will be again, which means it's not the end, something bad was going to happen. So I wondered, and people try to teach me, that it began in 70 AD. What happened in, and Jesus said, in that time you'll run to the hills. Pray that you're not pregnant, because they would run because the, the, the Romans came with 80,000 soldiers and demolished Jerusalem, and they were scattered. They were scattered from 70 AD to 1948. Now, I'm from a product from a family that were really suffered in the Holocaust. A lot of our family disappeared. We don't know where they ever went to. We don't know what happened to them. And my family escaped on a refugee ship that took them to Africa. So I understand. And to me, that was the horror of horrors. But now I've learned from the Lord that's only one little chapter. When they left in 70 AD, they were scattered throughout the world, the nation of Israel, and they suffered persecution and continual 1948, they became a nation, and if you're not aware, right now, they're under huge fire and pressure. It's constant, and they are your joint heirs and brothers. We are family with them, and we suffer with them. 
And right now, there's one war after another. Last night, there was 370 uh, missiles shot at Jerusalem to try and destroy. And it was an uh, un uncalled for attack from, well, just because, you know, Iran and the people around them, Yemen and different, and the Syria, all attacking at the same time. They're under, under constant attack because they've had nothing but war. But if you look, read the word, you'll always see that God delivered them. God delivered them. God delivered them. You can never know your husband or your wife just by meeting them and being with them a short while. It's all the difficulties you've gone through that you've got to really know them. In fact, I found a scripture that I just don't like, that I would have loved to have removed. In the book of Mark, chapter 9, the last verse says, verse 50 says, that we are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's worth nothing but we trampled. But the verse before that, which is the one I don't like, verse 49 says, everyone, everyone, is salted by fire. So when you're going through the fire, God is salting you. Because we have to be a salt to the world. We have to make a difference. And you don't get salty without being through, having gone through something. I've seen people, young people, criticize and have judgments and opinions about people. And I watch them, go, I don't say much, I watch them go through life and they change. Because they learn to find out that they go through stuff themselves and they shut their mouth in a hurry because everybody goes through stuff. No matter who you are, you can do all the faith conjuring confession you like. You're going to go through stuff. And that's what teaches you. You learn through the suffering and the hardships. And God is, didn't cause it, but he's certainly going to use it as to polish us and to grow us. Because you don't know, learn to know God until you've been through a suffering. I've found that if I ask Christians, how did they know that they're born again? Or how do they know there's really a God? They'll always recite jargon to me and they'll quote scriptures and they'll try to convince me what they've been taught. But if I keep pressing them, they all end up with the same answer. I know God because I've experienced him. What? 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 How, how did you experience God? They all end up saying the same thing. Well, how do you experience? Did you, did you feel him? Did you see him? No. I was in a crisis. And there was no way out. And I know that was God that answered my prayers. Because the evidence of only God could do that has always been one of God's strongest attributes throughout the history of the nation of Israel. And in your life, you learned to know God. You got born again. You accepted him. But you've been through so much stuff. And each time God would deliver you when there was no way out. No way out. And that's how you got to know him. We don't like that no way out thing. We don't like that crisis, that fire. But it's that which draws us all that closer to him that we get to know him. It's through that crisis. And God is gracious always to help us. I have learned that God makes things to work together for good according to a purpose that he has for those that love him. You can't have one part and not the whole, read the whole verse. So God has those that love him, that honor him, that look to him, that have, all have a purpose. And everything you go through, every crisis and every bad decision, every wrong thing you did, while you have a purpose in your life because you love God, he's going to make the worst of the crises work for good. He's not going to allow it. He's going to forcefully make it. He's going to very deliberately make, work it until it works for your benefit. When I look at the life, and most Jews will celebrate David as a great example of relationship with God. And David had so many crises in his own life. First of all, everyone loves David, but he was such a throwback. He didn't look like any Jew I would recognize. Red head, red complexion. I mean, really, who did he look like? And his own dad had no regard. He's, when his dad was told, you're going to have one of your sons be king. Which one? Uh, we don't know yet. One of them. So he's eight boys, and seven of them get invited because in his dad's mind, David did not qualify. Well, what would make him not qualify, Jesse? Well, his mother. Well, who is his mother? There's no record of her. 
So she may not possibly not even been Jewish. We don't know. But God didn't choose him for his genetics or his red head. God chose him because I found a man after my own heart. How could you find a man after your own heart? But a boy. Where did he get to that place that you could tell he has your heart? How did you know? What did you like about him? Because in my observation of David, he had so many problems. He was, like me, a very bad father. I, I spoil my kids. I don't know how to say no to my children. Uh, and he was even worse than I am. He had this idiot called Absalom who was trying to overthrow him and destroy the kingdom. And he was so sorry and grievous when his son was killed that the captain of the army said, if you don't stop grieving, we're all going to leave you. We've had enough of this now. The whole of Israel would turn against David because he was so grieving. And then he had a problem. With, he had wives. Not one, several. Who, who can cope with that? Not me, but he has all these wives. <laughs> and then he has concubines. That's not enough. He sees another man's wife. And it was, that's been listed in the Word of God, continued even after Uriah was dead. Always spoke about Uriah's wife, not David's. And it wasn't a moment of weakness. He didn't say, oh, it was such a moment. I was in the bed. No, no. He looked out of his palace. He looked. That wasn't the sin. Then he inquired. He, he wanted to know, who's, hey, who, who's that? Whoa, you got any binoculars? Come. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to her. When I get to heaven, I'm going to say, girl, why were you bathing outside? Did your mama raise you? Is that, is that how you were taught? What's wrong with you, girl? Why would you do that? Anyway, <laughs> he looked and then they said, oh, that's Uriah's wife. Can you, can you get her to come? Can you go say, did you not hear I said she's married? What? I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> don't you trust me? Yeah. My kids used to ask me, don't you trust me? I said, I don't even trust me. <laughs> Why would I trust you? <laughs> so, so he sends for her and of course she gets pregnant. And then <clears throat> when finally when Nathan, the prophet, confronts him, I would have thought he would have got onto his immoral life standard, but he got onto something much different. He said, what, this, what God has against you, you killed Uriah with the hand of the Philistines. Shed innocent blood. That really upset God. And God used not the first wife or second wife or the firstborn. God uses this relationship to birth the lineage of Christ. I mean, it's so strange what all the things that God did. Can you imagine Jesse, the, the father of David? Now, they're having a big barbecue, and he's got some of his buddies around him, and they're all celebrating. So, Jesse, you got your son's king. Who ever thought? Yeah. And they're talking about David, and so discussing Jesse's whole family. So tell me about your parents, and they're talking about what they did and what they were like. And how about your grandma? And Jesse's grandma, what, what, what do you want to know about my grandma? What did she do? She was a what, what? What? She was what? A prostitute? Wow, who knew? Rahab would be the mother, the grand, great grandmother. And just so God would turn things around. And even so, why I'm telling this people in this room, you devil's trying to steal your hope. He's trying to tell you you've got no future. He's trying to tell you you should go back and fix what messed up. If you only hadn't done that, if you only had made that decision, if you only listened to your parents, he's always trying to tell you what not to do or going to happen, trying to discourage you and steal from you your destiny. But God makes deliberately that stuff work, even your mistakes, for good according to the purpose. Because God has a purpose for you. And however much time you give him to let his purpose work in your life, he's going to make that stuff work. No matter what your age is or what years you think you've wasted, God is into moments. He's not into long periods of time. God cares about moments that change. You know, Joseph had one single moment that was of critical importance. He appeared before Pharaoh and he got to Pharaoh because he had a gift to interpret dreams. The dreams and the gift got him to the Pharaoh. But what got Pharaoh's heart wasn't the dream interpretation. He said to the Pharaoh, now Pharaoh, find someone in your nation. And he lays out a plan of, of saving that nation. This, this man is not an Egyptian. He's a slave, worthless slave put into prison. 
and he's not looking to get out or find a way to get through. He so unselfishly cares only for a nation that's been nothing but horrible to him. That for the salvation, and when the Pharaoh hears and sees this man cares not for himself, he says to his leaders, Can we find in all of Egypt a man with a heart like this? Now, to have a heart like this, he had to go into a big well, thrown down the well, then with shackles and irons be led astray and sold in a market like a slave. And then spend 13 years in slavery, then get falsely accused, put into prison, just so he could have a heart. And whatever God had to do in your life, whatever has gone on in your life, whatever mistakes you think you've made and made, God uses it to work your heart because he's preparing you for a moment. Because had Joseph not done that moment right, he would have not been that key person. Because had Joseph not gone and been in that place that his whole family came and that the nation of Israel was born 400 years later out of that, there would have been no savior. Then you would not be sitting here today. Joseph had a vital role to play, as do many of you who can't see your role. You feel regret because you wish you can go back and change. If only I had, I should have, I could have, I would have. But this, it was my parents. They did this. This happened. I was a victim. But God will work everything together for good according to a purpose because God is way bigger. You Samaritans worship what you don't, you, Samaritans, right? What you don't know. We Jews worship what we know because we've suffered. We have suffered and seen God break through every time. They're suffering now and they're hopeless in God. We should tell you about all the things happening, but there are so many of them praying and worshiping God and singing songs of deliverance because they, this makes them come back to God. This makes them call upon the Lord. And God has a much bigger plan in motion that's so important for all of us because we're all tied to this. Do you understand? All of it, the whole ecology of God is tied to his people. God had to birth a people that the whole world know belongs to him. You show me one people that speak the same language for 6,000 years. You show me one people that don't lose their identity, being cast aside and cast throughout the world for 2,000. Show me one people that keep worshiping God and serving God and putting God first, the best they know how, and that we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for them. Do you understand? And you are part of that. So I'm here to say, pull yourself together and don't give up. Don't look back. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Being sorry for yourself does not help. It's very (laughs) un-Jewish. We we Jews have our ways. We do whine and complain. It's part of our nature, but we keep going. And uh, we are expert guilters. (laughs) We know how to make you feel guilty about things. So you're not coming for Thanksgiving. I know you're so busy, and I want you to have a wonderful time. Just remember, it may be my last, but I want you to have your... (laughs) We know how to guilt people. You know, Jews don't have... You've heard of hebonics. They have their own language, Jews. You never get an answer out of a Jew. So, Issy, how are you? You should ask how I am. (laughs) You just can't get an answer. They just... We have our own language. I met a Jew yesterday. We had lunch with a... Uh, one of our, our guides in Israel, uh, he's, he's living, he's actually a fourth generation born in Israel, and he speaks, uh, he speaks he's got studied Hebrew, but he also, uh, as, a, as a language, as a profession, so I used to enjoy working with him, so we'd stop at every place, and he'd tell me this name means this. The Hebrew is such a magical language to me. It means like shalom, you've heard the name shalom. Shalom means so many different things. It doesn't mean just peace. It means perfect state of well-being. You know, <laughs> We're not allowed to use the name of God. So in the fear of using, they change it sometimes to the Lord. And you know the blessing, may the Lord bless and keep you. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. It doesn't doesn't say Adonai. That's what it means, Lord. Lord God is Adonai Lechem. That's what Lord God, but it says Chiawei. Chiawei bless you, which is the most personal way God could ever speak to us. His name, his own name. Chiawei bless you and to keep you. They just found, I don't know if you saw any of the articles, they found Yahweh, the name, in a rock. There's three letters in Yahweh. If you, we, read, we read from this way, that way. So it's the first word is, used to be. The middle letter is, 
right now, and the next that is going to be. So he's, he's, that's what it means. It's all, he's, he's, that's what Yahweh means. And so it says, Yahweh bless you, which means to do you so much good and to keep you. And that Hebrew word keep means to shelter you from COVID, from poverty, from sickness, from hardship, may shelter you. That's the, the first line with three lines with two verbs in every line. May Yahweh, God, make his light his light. Jesus said that if you walk in the, it's not 12 hours a day, if you walk in the light, you are safe. There's safety in God's light. If there's no darkness. You're always going to be protected. May he cause his light to shine upon you, upon you and give you grace. Now, if the grace in the Hebrew version of grace isn't the grace you understand, it's much, much more intense. If a little fly walks across my table, I could destroy it with a finger, just a mere push. We are mindful and God is mindful of how pity we are. And when he shows us grace here, he's tolerant of how small we are compared to him. That's the second line. The third line is, may he make his face shine. When it shines upon when his face looks upon you, all blessing, all goodness, everything is well with you and give you shalom, which is the major state of blessing. So when we say shalom, we say, of course, like yesterday they would have said or the day before even the Shabbat shalom, the blessing to you, blessing to you on for Shabbat. It's a blessing. They speak a blessing on you. So Hebrew would change every time wherever sentence is used in a very wonderful language. And so he used to help us anyway. He's very, very Jewish. Uh, <clears throat> My time's come. I'm going to start prophesying now. So lock the doors and repent of your sins. I'll give you a quick time to. Though they are many, <laughs> repent quickly. <laughs> All right. You, you haven't fun yet? I'm not, I'm not boring. It's true, Pastor. I'm not boring. I didn't make any jokes, but I'm not boring. When Pastor Ron begins, have you heard the one? That's when he's from. Have you heard the one? Then we get, we're not going to hear one. We're going to hear at least one dozen. <laughs> And how he remembers them? Only God. Only, because I can't. I just, I try to remember a joke, then I get it all messed up and I mess the ending up somehow. It's uh, getting old now just to get things. Yes, indeed. Rena, do me a favor, please. Pick me three people that don't often get words. Thank you for writing songs for us, girlfriend. You're a blessing to this church. I appreciate you. Your friend. You have friends? Oh, wow. Stand up, Kara. Stand up. She's a quiet, shy one, isn't she? You're walking bare feet in church? Look at that. She's comfortable. Holy ground. Okay, who said that? Oh, I recognize you. Okay, pick someone. I'll start with you while they're taking so long. So you have many colors in your hair. I know you weren't born like that. What's, what's your name you say? Kara. Kara. Kara, all right. What do you do, Miss Kara? You do? You've made the angel that watches over you sweat. I don't know what you've done. <laughs> you really have stretched it since you were a little girl. You just have no fear and do crazy stuff. And you don't think things through. You're very, very intelligent. But you don't always think everything through. You're kind of fast, impulsive, do it quick. But it, it has its advantage. It makes you respond to God and do things with, from the heart without thinking too much about the consequences. But the other side, it gets you in trouble. So we've got to keep a balance between the two of them. God's hand is definitely on you. He has been on you. He's rescued you so many times because of your heart. You have the heart of a champion. And God's teaching you how to watch what you say. Not because you're saying wrong, but because you just spill it all out in a hurry. And it's got you in trouble. And there's so much going on in your family that needs to be healed and fixed. And the less you say, the more God will heal. And that's hard for you. It's very hard. Because a lot of what you say is sense. A lot of what you say is truth. But you must let God do the talking. Let God help you. He's whispering in my ear, the one thing you must know, he says that I've, God says, I've always liked you. Since you were a little girl. They, were, they didn't all celebrate you, but God's always liked you. He loves you, but he's always liked you because of who you are. And he's had to always fix stuff. Since you're a little girl, fix stuff. But he's always liked you because of your heart. You are a great blessing to the kingdom. You really are. There is a breakthrough financially coming for you that's been a real tough thing. You're trying to balance everything and make everybody happy. You're the power. You're, the, you're really the power in the family. You're the strength that holds a lot of stuff together. But God's going to break through financially. There's a situation that's evolved that needs to be fixed financially. And God's going to intervene for you in the most amazing way. But he'll not fail you. He will not. Just don't get ahead of God in a hurry. Don't talk as much. Let God do the fighting for you. He'll help you. you got it? 
All right. As a sign to you, you have a little discomfort in your body right now. And when you leave here, it's going to leave you as a sign to you that I'm smiling on you. I'm smiling on you, girl. Go, go, go ahead. Temple over here in the what shirt? Okay. So what's your name, sir? Joe. Joe? Joe. Joseph. Joseph. All right. And uh, this is your wife? Oh, my goodness. Do you have a wife? That's, that's hard. I'm so sorry. It's, even if they're ill and you know they're going, it's still tough. It's still tough. It's, it's just hard. 50 years. You were 10 when you got married? You were 10 years old when you got married? 10 years old? Tells you you have more hair than I have. So this is your daughter, you say? What's your name? Could you, would you stand? And these kids are your kids? Yeah. Of your six kids? Wow, you didn't have television? <laughs> so, uh, no, but that's what God wanted her to do. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Joe. I'm very glad you shared that with me. So how many kid, grandkids do you have, Joe? What? Grandchildren. Six. Oh, just one child and six grandkids? My sister doesn't have Okay, she's got two children. They've got two kids then, okay? All right, I've got the picture. What do you do, Joe? I'm retired now. From? I have my own concrete flat work business. Okay. <clears throat> the Lord calls you uh, his soldier. It seems like you've had to endure so many different kinds of wars and hardship and you always pressed in and did did the very best you can always helping and no one had to wonder what you think but you seem to be able to share the, with them what you think and how you feel strongly but at the same time you, you may bark about doing stuff but you end up doing it anyway but you've got a real kind heart in the long long run so the barking is just a lot of noise uh, but to God loves you and he's on your side and your wife didn't just pass. She went straight through into heaven. There's no question. She was, she was an angel. There was no other way to describe it. And it's her prayers that have got you here today because she has prayed and cried over your life that you be strong in the Lord. And she always believed in you, always believed in you. And so that's what God has done for you. So what do you do, ma'am? A good nurse too, I believe. You have no idea how valuable you are. I'm so sorry that you underappreciated. Very sorry about that. People don't tell you enough what a blessing you are. You're so unselfish and just give all the time. You ask nothing. I see you even hang things back on the rack. You will not spend more than a certain amount on yourself. You just, and God sees all that unselfish, generous spirit that you have. You're a good mom and the best of your life is still coming. Great shall be your reward here and there. So that you will know your reward's coming for all your hard labor and all you've given so hard. I don't know, what's your husband's name? Jay? I see God doing a whole new work in that man's life. I mean, complete change. You wouldn't even recognize him when God's done working inside of him and just do a brand new thing. He's tried, struggled so many areas of his life. God's going to bring him in victorious in so many ways. And the little children, can they stand up? The two that are there, stand up, girls, stand up. Arise and shine. What's your name? The first one. Laura? Nora. How old are you, Nora? 15. Are you married? <laughs> what do you want to do with your life, Nora? You're a smart one. You need to go to school and college. It's very important for your life. For success, you need to do this because you do study. You're very methodical and you keep plodding. You don't give up. Just keep going. You, your friends are all waiting for you in college. That's where your best friends are, not here. You've got the one friend here that's, not, that's good, but you're going to have a lot more in college. That's where the friends are really waiting for you, right? She's at that teenage stage, so it's all that, you know, drama queen stuff. Okay, so <laughs> what's your... What? Can I share one more thing with you? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Wow. 
I hope there are no leprechauns waiting for you there. All right. So what is your name? Anna. Anna. Sweet Anna, everybody's friend, every delight, through the light of the Father's heart. You really are sweet and kind and generous of heart. You have a call of God in her life. She wants to do something for the Lord and help people. Well, she likes animals now, but she'll like people later. That's what... Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Did you want to pick some people for me? Did you get, did you get three, Jenna? How many do you have? How many do you have? Where's the three? I'm going to keep my word. Then, then you're going to pick some for me. What happened? What's your name? Alex. Alex. I'm assuming that your knees are broken like that in your jeans because you pray, <laughs> because you pray so much on your knees. As long as I live, I'll never understand we buy clothes that are broken. That, that is beyond my mind. How do you put them on? Don't you, don't, aren't you scared you'll tear them more? My feet go through all of these bolts first. Oh, that's what I was thinking. I, would, I could imagine myself struggling with that. Yeah. All right, and then it'd be cold. I mean, so what, what is your name? Alexa, you said? Alexis. And Alexis. And this is your? Sorry. What's his name? Silas. Silas. And Paul, he's a friend of Paul. Where's Paul then? You haven't got Paul yet. Are you only have the one child? Oh, gosh, I have five. You have five? Yeah, How old are you? How old are you? 29. You are 20? Are you sure? <laughs> you look about 17 to me, doesn't she? <laughs> wow, it's amazing. You have five kids. Wow, you're not the only ones that had 20, who still had 20 kids? Uh, somebody had a bunch of kids, right? Oh, you had, right, over there. So, what does your husband do? Sounds like not very much. Okay, good. You, you really know what he's doing. I'm glad. So what, what, what do you do? I'm a seven. I would imagine <laughs> raising all those kids. And where does he fit in? What number is he? He is number four. Number four. Okay. So I really rejoice in who you are. Because when you make your decision, you stick to it. And you've made decisions about God and following after the Lord, even when it costs you. And everything you've done, yes, I know, I agree, has everything you've done is written in the book of remembrance it's written so nothing is lost all your labor and God's gonna give you the house that you asked him for he's gonna give all that you asked not it's not too hard for the Lord is it's been a struggle but you're gonna have the house you're gonna say I wish I'd had it years ago because it's so perfect but it, even when it's so big you still need it for the grandchildren it's gonna always be necessary do you understand that you have a, you have very you're a very very good mother not only because you watch over your kids, but you're very inserted in their lives. You pay attention to them, and you teach them really well. And that's what I, what I really enjoy spiritually, prophetically about you, is that you make your decision, and you stick to it. No matter what they say, even your parents say, you're going to do what you, what you know is right, what you believe. If you're the only one, you're going to push those kids in the ways of God. And great shall be your reward for that. Yeah. It is not God's will for you to move from this area, but it is God's will for your husband to have a different job situation. He's going to work with a very old friend of his from he hasn't seen for a while and there's going to be some little company together. He's a hard worker and he's very smart. He's a good guy and he's not getting the full potential that he has inside of him. You know, he's not scared to work. He's got he's there, but he just uh, can push himself a little hard. But the Lord's knocking on his door too to bring a new joy and gladness back in his life. And and so you're a wonderful couple. This little boy, how old is he say? He's three years old. His name is Silas, that's right, Silas. Silas is very strong-willed, and he's got, a sport, he's got a sport gift in him. He doesn't know how to lose. He hates losing. He has to always win and get what he wants. So we need to give him the competitive uh, space that he needs when the time comes to do the sport he wants to do because he needs it to burn the energy because he'll tire you out. The boy's got no end to his energy. Then the eldest one, what's the eldest one's name? Your eldest child's name? Haven. Haven? You called... You called her Haven? I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And where's her, how old is she? Seven. Where is she now? She's in first grade. Haven is a, is, a, is a little leader and way much a mommy already. She's really the, really the leader in so many ways and just responsible. And uh, she's all around balanced. And you don't have to wonder what she's thinking. She likes to tell you and talk a little. But then the second one? Uh, Nova. Nova. I'm not, I don't dislike them, I'm just surprised. That's all. 
I know John and Peter and Mary. I don't know this Nova. Nova? Yeah, I, I know what Nova is. Thank, thank you, but I just... I, my name is Nova. Right. And how old is he? She. See? 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 Six. She's six. She's this different child, but a different personality. And uh, um, she's a go-get-em girl. And she has her own little way. Don't, she's going to be so, don't touch my stuff. I've got my own plans. And she'll always be a little different to the rest of the family. She'll always be pulling one side. You're not going to change that. It's who she is. But she'll be very loyal and dedicated to you. And she wants what she wants. When she makes up her mind, she doesn't ask a lot. But you better give her or work, remember what she wants because she's very adamant at those things. She's a go-get-em girl. She's a real go-get-em girl. Are you the fella? Are you the factory? I was telling your wife that you're going to, uh, you're going to work with an old friend of yours. You're going to start a little business together. But you, you're not scared to work. You're a hard worker. And you're good at what you do. You're good at, you can do almost anything. And so it's not the, it's not the skill that you're not having or education. It's just the opportunity. The only difficulty you have that I have a problem with you is you don't know when to stop. You just keep going. You'll work till late at night and not come in. You just keep going and keep going and keep going. And you've got to find some boundaries that are more healthy, right? And uh, get a television because five kids is a lot. <laughs> there are other things in life. <laughs> okay, that's, which one's Nova? So this one's Haven. Yeah, hello, Haven. Hello, Nova. Yeah, strong little Nova. She knows what she wants. Gonna, she's going to get all the best. She you knows expensive taste, too. And then the, I'm missing the fourth one. What's the fourth one? Fifth one. Fifth one. Third one? No, we've got him already. He's number four, so we have another girl. Okay, we've got enough girls, okay. So what's her name? Phoenix. Right. <laughs> She'll be rising by the time I get there. Um, Phoenix. And how old is she? Five, the little singer. Phoenix is a singer and uh, artistic, very gifted, very creative. Um, you know, see the music inside that child, very strong. You have music inside of you. You just never used it. The worship has never come yet, but it's going to come. And then with that, I've got all four. I see one child missing? The baby. Which is? Octavia. <laughs> is that a female? She's a girl. So you have one boy? Yeah. Okay. Really? <laughs> I feel comforted. No one, okay. That's it. Did you know it's no more kids? You're sleeping in the other room. <laughs> I hope you don't mind my humor. Uh, please don't be offended at me. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just, got, I'm just very lighthearted by nature. So, you like it? Yes. Yeah, thank you. But the rest might not. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let me get back to this younger child. Uh, the name again is Octavia. Octavia is born to lead. There's no question. Strong, smart, medical gifting uh, will be a lot in the medical. More like a rescuer, a person that rescues. So Octavia is going to surprise you a lot. It was a very big gift, that child. It was, it was very important. Um, it's, it's not a small thing that you have so many girls because all your girls will be strong. Uh, so you're far stronger than you think you are. Nobody believed in you when you grew up, but God always knew that there's nothing small in you. Everything was always great. And you'll have great children, great family. You'll do great things. You'll have your own house. You're going to have a big house. It is not new. It's older and it's much bigger. But you're going to fix it because you can. You can, do, you can fix anything. And you will do a really good job. Masterpiece. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. All right. Your turn. <laughs> Who? Ashley. Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Ashlyn. Okay, are you married, Miss Ashlyn? Yes. Do you know who to? Yes. What's his name? Santos. Santos. Where is he? He's at work. That's a good thing to do on a Sunday, I suppose. What do you, do you have children? Yes, we have two. Only two? They have five. <laughs> oh, because you're going to plan, they have, you're going to keep, see what they do, five kids? No, I'm good. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> a 22-year-old and a 17-year-old. Oh, you, what? That's yeah. hard to believe. Okay, what do you do? The word of the Lord for you is to leave behind you what's behind you. Keep trying to balance your past with your present and your future. You can't. His name is not I was, but I am. So shake off the past and 
grab the future. You're still trying to balance your life as things don't pan out the way you want. You're not highest demand or it's not your nature. You don't want a lot in life, but things just don't want to work the way you want because you, you're in control. Let God take control and fight for you. Be shocked at what God will do. You have so much ability and talent. Uh, you won't stay where you are in the industry. Well, in the industry, you'll stay, but not the same job. You're going to be Come more administrative in the industry you'll be. I don't know what it is exactly, whether you have a business where you're hiring people that do what you do, something like that, and renting them out, all kinds of stuff that you've got planned, because you're good at what you do. You're very good at people, and you're a fast business little lady. You always have a head inside of you, and uh, people underestimated you. And You went through a hard time before, but not with this guy. He's just different, and God's going to awaken some things in him, but he's a good guy. You married the right guy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. And this guy, what's your name, sir? John, gift of God. That's what it means. And are you married, John? No, I'm Do you know who to? <laughs> Abriana. Where is she? Uh, she's back in New York. New York. You don't bring her here no, much? Uh, I'm in the Navy. So. In the, yeah, I've got a grandchild in the Navy, too. She was deployed to the whole East. She's got back, yeah, my granddaughter. So, and you, um, what do you do in the Navy? Do you know? A sonar technician, I bet you're good at that. So uh, there's a lot of development in that arena of your life. You'll be doing a lot more technical studies and things. You'll be highly qualified because you love that stuff and you're good at it. You're very patient, a little slow for my liking, but you're very patient. Everything you do is patient and slow and you don't do well pressure. Don't pressurize me, I don't function. And, but you get it done. What I love about you is there's no do-overs. You do it right the first time. And I, it's not only with your technical side, but also with relationships. You don't jump into a relationship, you don't hurry into anything, but you're there for the long haul. It's the same with God. You're there for the long haul, and you'll always be doing what's right. You'll take it slow. Don't push me. I'll get there, but I must first look at it all carefully. And you're very noble. got a very noble heart. You always do what's right. You'll stop, pull over the car, and help someone that needs to be, have a wheel change. It's just your nature to be noble, and God salutes you and honors you for it. He'll deny you nothing. You'll stay in the Navy for a while, but not for the, for the whole haul you think you will. That's what God's plan is for you. Hello, princess. What's your name? Cassandra. Cassandra. And how old are you, may I ask? I am 23. 23. And next to you is, who's that next to you? My future sister-in-law. You look very young. How old are you? Okay, and she's going to marry your brother. Okay. Uh, I'm marrying her brother. Okay, gets so confusing here. You marrying her brother. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, good. Where is he? He's working. Good. What does he do? Just a custodian at a nursing home. Okay, and what's his name? Clayton. Clayton? Okay. Clayton, uh, God has spared him. He was supposed to not be here. He was supposed to have been dead. God saved his life, rescued him. But he's a good guy, and he hasn't finished his school yet. He's got some schooling stuff. He's made some real changes in his life because he didn't always go down the right road, and God turned him around. And, and you need to follow after God with all of your heart because you belong to the Lord. You belong to God. You, made, you have made promises to God that if he'd help you and rescue and do things for you, that you would serve him. And you're going to serve him. You're going to be a very wonderful instrument in his hands and touch a lot of people's lives. You're not finished your education. I see some things you're going to go back to school and finish and fine-tune and, and qualify. In. But that's what God's planned for you to do. You'll have great success. You can fix everybody in your family. It's not possible. There's a lot of healing necessary. And God's going to heal and restore things without your help. He's going to do it by his spirit because of your prayers. Do you understand that? Okay, so when you get married... Yeah, I feel very positive in my spirit about the, about the relationship. Very happy in my heart for you. Thank you. Dude. Oh, love the hair. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Joseph Peter. Oh, Joseph Peter. Uh, are you as strong as you look? Sometimes. All right. <laughs> this is your wife next to you? Yes. And my son and the daughter. In the... What's your name, young lady? Courtney. Hi, Courtney. Thank you for marrying him. It was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it, right? <laughs> what do you do for a living, sir? <coughs> okay. You're an interesting fella. You're very smart. The only person who doesn't know it is you. You never did the whole academic thing, but you just weren't interested. But you had the ability. You're very, very smart. You never make the same mistake twice. God doesn't catch you twice. And you've gotten burned a few times, and I'm very thankful and grateful you've made some good decisions because you weren't hanging out with the right people before. And God had to deliver you from the wrong crowds that you start to 
choosing more wholesome things. And so you, your whole life is changing now as a family man where you belong. And you're going to have your own business. That's God's plan. I don't know if it's HVAC or what it is, but you will definitely have your own business because you're that smart. You have a little bit of an anger issue that comes up once in a while that we need to heal or get, or get under control, whatever it is, because that, that there's little things that spark it. And you're very repentant afterwards and you, when you cool down because that's who you are because you've got a very good heart. You want to do what's right. But God wants to bless you. And if that gets out of control, the devil will always push the buttons and mess you up. So I'm here to ask you to, to be purposeful in your heart to get that Holy Ghost to control that thing in your life. Simple. As for you, ma'am, I thanked you in a joke for marrying him, but I do thank you before the Lord because he needs you. He does. He needs you because you always make space for him even when he does things that could have been avoided. And you've been a great wife to him and you will always be a great wife to him. Uh, he underestimated you. didn't think that you had the discernment that you have. You're much sharper. And he, he tried getting away with stuff when he first met you, but you, you, it's like you just know things. And, he, and it's the prophetic side of your life. And you are such an amazing woman. And uh, money will, your reward will come. Money will come. You're going to work with him in his business. You are, you are that little person on the phone and talking to the customers and you are that person. And your kids will come to be able to come to the office and, and it, uh, it's just not always very organized because you, you can't cope with a lot of stuff at the same time. It just it looks sometimes like a bomb exploded there sometimes because you're just overloaded. It's not because you're not tired, you're just overloaded. And that's, uh, but God is with you. And uh, you, uh, do you have two children right now? Are you planning more? Yeah. Because I see a couple more. Okay, <laughs> just thought I might say that. All right, thank you uh, so much. Pam, ma'am, Pastor, Denise. Sir, what is your name? Everaldo. Everaldo. And next to you is your wife. Wife? Yes. Stand up, young lady. What's your name? What's your name? Camila. Camila, okay. What do you do, sir? Do car detailing. You do car detailing. Yeah. Okay. Where do you get those muscles from? Walmart? <laughs> Yeah. I've got muscles like that. I just can't find them. I put them, some, I put them somewhere. <laughs> so, car detailing, huh? Here's the word of the Lord for you that you cannot look back in your life anymore. You uh, have some regrets and some mistakes, and God's got so many good things for you up ahead. You won't stay with the detailing. It's a good thing to keep you going for now, but you're smart, and you've got a good businessman. You had the wrong friends and didn't do or make the right decisions. You're just looking for the shortcuts, and you had a lot of challenges Growing up even, it was nothing was easy and you, the Lord had to rescue you because if you had stayed on that track, you would, have, you would have not been in a good place now. God had to help you because he's always been tender towards you because he saw the heart. He made, God made a promise to someone in your family about you. Someone that touched heaven, I think they may not even be here anymore, but they we promised God. They promised God and God promised them. And that's why you're here because God will not let go of you because of their promise. And so he's going to watch over you and you will do a great thing. In fact, you never think even today you never would have been imagined how God's going to use you. You're going to be a real coach. Not only in, in schools, you're going to be a coach in the kingdom to help coach people in life because you've learned so much stuff from wrong decisions. And you just don't want to go down that road anymore. As for you, ma'am, it's been a journey. It's been a, it's been a journey for you, but you're far more discerning and smart and you're having to let go of a lot of stuff. You had to run for your life in some, some ways, but the future has just begun. God has got a plan for you. You've had some things that God would not do to deliver in your own family, heal and fix. This is the beginning of an amazing, amazing journey. It's a story that hasn't even been told, the magnificent things of your life. Because you were born and God watched over you from the very young age. The stuff you've been through, nobody in this room can imagine. Nobody. They'll think you're lying. But yet it's made you stronger. It's made you stronger. And you will change people's lives everywhere you go because of who you are. It's amazing the two of you come together because you'll be an unstoppable force. All you have to do is surrender to the Lord. Let him have full control of your lives and you'll be shocked at how God will use you and bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. God will bless you. There's, how many children do you have? Any? You have two kids? Two daughters. How old are they? And how does, what's the eight-year-old's name? Isabella. Isabella. 
Isabella's got a little princess heart. She likes nicer things, and she can she likes all the pleasant things of life. But she's very susceptible. You need to be watch out. She perceives things very quickly in the spirit, and she's she's she has got prophetic stuff and going on in her already. She's seen angels and she sees things. She feels things. And the next one. Yeah, she's strong. She's strong-willed and she'll run the whole house if you give her a chance. She's very bossy. She'll be bossy and she'll strong because she's meant to be. She's meant to be a strong leader in your household. And that's what's going to be wonderful. And you've got two beautiful kids. And that's what I, I don't know if I there anymore, but I see those two becoming great lighthouses in people's lives. Amazing family. You are an amazing family. Good. The, the, the boss lady said one more. Hello, Grandma. Yes. <laughs> How many grandkids do you have? I have two. I have ten. <laughs> but you can get some of mine because they're expensive. <laughs> so, Grandma, you come to this church? Yes. You like it here? Yes. I see the healing anointing on your life. God's fixing something in your body and extending your years. He wants you to know there's life inside of you. You get all frustrated about so many things in your life. And, and uh, God says, leave the stuff to me. You want God to help you, but then you get involved. And God wants you to step back, step back, get off that phone. Let me deal with it. I'll take care of it. Don't react. I'll take care of it. You can't fix everybody's life. You've always been the fixer. Let me fix them. Let me take care of it. You've always, they, people criticize you and avoid you because you're so strong and, and you, you know how to express yourself. But the truth is, there's no motive in you other than to help and do. You're not doing it for selfish reasons. You just have a, you have that heart and they, you may, they may think you're controlling or pushy, but it's really your heart is to help them. You always want to help and serve everybody and God appreciates that God honors you for your heart to want to give and do and you mustn't stop that just add the wisdom to it so God can give you more back you more fruitful your work is not done you have many years ahead of your life many many years and you're not you know you go want to move here you want to do this you want to go here actually God says I want to use you because you're a go-get'em girl you know how to get things done you don't want to sit there and whine and complain and be like an old person you want to get on and do stuff it's just you don't do old you just don't do old person things you want so so you're going to get on and you're going to get the things done you're an amazing woman in that way in so many ways you're a blessing and your children will become uh, very fruitful because of your life because of your prayers God is with you who can be against you thank you so much all right now, <clears throat> the, the, the word, I asked the Lord to, for a word for this church and for the leadership and so on. And, and there's, God's got a season of growth in this church. God has a season where he is adding people that have been wandering around looking for a home. It's a very difficult area, this northeast, to minister in. It's a very uh, strong hold of, of we don't need anybody independent, I don't want you to just leave me alone, don't bother with me, I'll talk to you, but don't ask me about God. And yet, when the Spirit starts moving, and so what God is doing, He's making them come here, or find you on the internet, the odd people, and then it's spilling over from them onto others. His method of reaching the lost is different here. And that's what God's doing. And he's bringing people in when they're great need. So because of the great need, God's going to school this church and keep using schools in this church of ministry so that you are prepared to help bring healing, delivering men, families, uh, bring salvation in the, in the most diplomatic, godly, uncompromised way. And so many things are like that. You'll be relevant in this church. So wherever God's going to use you, wherever you're willing to be used, God will function through you. It's that simple. And that God's looking for anybody that's available. And you have great pastors and they are, they are passing on to a lot of the next generation that are coming up more and more. And some of the people you didn't even notice are going to become leaders in this church because that's what the Lord is doing. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for what you do for God. The two of you are just wonderful, wonderful people. Mm -hmm.